It's a bank holiday next Friday. OK. Oh, it Friday. Friday is Friday the 29th next week. So that would be the Easter bank holiday. On a Friday, though, bank holidays are usually on Mondays. It's Good Friday. It's Good Friday. OK, you can see how uh, strictly religious <laughs> my life is by the calendar. OK. <clears throat> yeah, it's Wednesday the 27th. Um, yeah, the 29th. I was just thinking if the 27th fell on, fell on a university closure day, I sort of by memory thought that there might be some extra closure days, but I, I may be wrong about that. Anyway, if I discover that or if somebody else discovers it, um, that may alter the schedule. But nevertheless, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Give one more last um, nod to the web page in, in case people are interested. <clears throat> what we've been doing, if I make it a little smaller for the purposes of this, is we've been going through the boot camp. As most of you know, there are, are 12 sessions planned and then an optional session with Markdown and GitHub, which some people are interested in. We're up to um, session eight today. And uh, if you'd like to follow along with such things, uh, you can go ahead and download the slides and look at the link to bootcamp page eight. And um, the way we're going to do it today, and and maybe to some degree the rest of the sessions uh, in the bootcamp run, is um, Megan and I will attempt to share duties. The way we're going to do that tonight is um, I'm going to open up the slides here that that Megan has prepared from the uh, from the bootcamp material. And she's going to deliver the slides and then we'll just do shuffling chairs and I'll do the code part uh, in case anything surprising or fun happens. I'll get to have the fun. <laughs> OK, so uh, if you just hit the slides. It downloads, so that's good. Let's just open it and have a look. Um, one thing I want to say about um, the rest of the sessions is that uh, we'll just plan to do them weekly. And um, if 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 you choose, pick and choose to do some, the, these sessions are the ones starting next week with um, the actual simple statistical tests. So we'll cover correlation and simple linear regression, one way analysis of variance um, and um, and related tests, including uh, so-called non-parametric tests. And this is all from the perspective of someone who hasn't done data analysis before. So I tried to make it suitable and accessible to everybody. Um, the bootcamp page is linked on the um, page, but there it is in case you like to follow along with it. Come up to the top. We will switch to the slides. We will share this screen. We will switch the presenter view. And I will um, make this so that we can see chat the same time. Here we go. And uh, without further ado, Megan will begin. Cool. OK, so last week, I believe you guys were looking at um, exploring data prior to um, running some analysis. And today is a bit of a follow on to that. So. We're basically looking at distributions today. Um, and we have a lovely cute picture of a bull here, but I won't spend too much time on that. So some of the objectives of today is to look at histograms, which I believe had a brief introduction to that last week. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to focus on three main different types of data distribution. And finish off with a bit of strategy in terms of how you can go about diagnosing the distribution of your data um, when you're doing analyses. So histograms, these are um, a good way of looking at the distribution of the data that you have, and it does this in a way by plotting your numeric variable along the x axis, and you can see the frequency of the observations on the y axis. and here you can see what looks like a very good normal distribution of the weight of some cap. Um, 
But what you can also get is with different samples and populations, there's sort of differences in that. And I believe you also covered that previously in terms of differences between samples and populations. Mm -hmm. um, but something to keep in mind when you're talking about distributions is how as you have bigger samples, um, your sort of distribution of data can resemble more of a normal distribution. Oh, but don't say normal. <laughs> there were air quotes. <laughs> but as Ed mentioned, he prefers to refer to them as Gaussian distributions, um, which we will go into a little bit more later. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand back over to Ed so he can do some fun R stuff about some cats, I think. Cats and more cats. All right, let's see here. So uh, to do this, we'll just flip over to the website. Now, <clears throat> I understand in the interest of time why you went past that bull so quickly, but I, I wondered if, if people have heard of the wisdom of crowds before. Okay. And the the normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution, was mathematically described by a uh, an old dead guy named Gauss, who humbly named it after himself. But it was this uh, this guessing and sampling concept that had to do with a bull that's associated with the wisdom of crowds story, and uh, that was discovered by. Um, it was described first by Francis Galton, this this famous relative of um, of Charles Darwin. I like to tell this story because it, it's an historical uh, event in statistics history. But uh, also, I like to tell it because of Galton's foibles. Um, one, he's he was kind of famously a, not a very nice person. He was an elite member of the uh, the the wealthy landowning gentry, and. Um, one of the things amongst the many, he was probably a genius himself. He did study a lot of things. You don't have to be a, a nice person to also be very clever. But one of the things that he um, studied was the inheritance of of genius. And uh, by his own um, by his own measure, he was himself a genius. And there was an inordinate occurrence of genius in his own family tree including Charles Darwin, who he graciously uh, said was a super genius. Um, but he was also a racist. Uh, he was a eugenicist and not one of those people that was just caught up of their time. He, he really didn't like um, non-white people and he was, he was very vocal about it. Um, but nevertheless, one of the things that he did was that uh, he discovered this phenomenon called the wisdom of crowds that had to do with the Gaussian distribution. And uh, what he found was that if you had a crowd of people and they were to guess the weight of this bull, most people would be wrong about the weight. Uh, the important part of it was that um, whether you were wrong higher or whether you were wrong lower in the guess was random. And that the fewer people guessed high or low, very different to the mean than guessed high or low close to the mean, and the distribution of guesses was a very good approximation of actual weight. All right, but um, I've already digressed. Megan was doing so good trying to keep me in check. Um, one of the things I want to do is um, talk about ways to explore your own data. And uh, I've gone ahead and I've started a script just like normal, and I've put in a little bit of information in the header. I'm going to go ahead and put this in section 2.1. Now I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for people. <clears throat> well, one of the things I want to introduce to you is the, um, the idea of simulating data. This is a very powerful technique when you have your own data to look at. Um, if you have some data that you suspect are normal, you could simulate similar data from an actual normal distribution using a function like the rnorm function. If we run that help and we bring it up, we can see there are a family of uh, norm distributions. The, the rnorm version is for a random normal 
um, um, variable and we can set the mean and standard deviation of that random normal um, variable. And that's not a coincidence, these two argument um, quantities, because it's the mean and standard deviation that describes the Gaussian or the normal distribution. It turns out that every different distribution has its own parameters for describing it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Another one we're going to introduce this time is um, set.seed. <clears throat> You're going to go through something that has a simulated or a random component. We often might want to use, um, use a, a reproducible set of instructions for it. So if I were to ask for a random normal variable with a mean of um, zero and a standard deviation of one, it would be you know, random every time. It's actually pseudo random. I'm, I will try to save time by not explaining pseudo random, but it's pseudo random. If anybody's interested in that, um, you can ask. I'll be happy to explain it later. But um, if we want to have the exact same um, reproducible random normal set of numbers, we could set our seed, which is uh, a way to, um, to have that reproducibly constructed every time. And then histogram is one we already talked about. It's a way of examining distributions. OK, so just as Megan said, we're going to um, simulate some some cat weights. <clears throat> what I'm doing here is I'm um, setting the seed just to uh, any any integer. I'm going to uh, use the R norm function to simulate the uh, the weight of 10,000 cats. So n is 10,000. The mean is four kilograms and the standard deviation is half a kilogram. Okay, so we can go ahead and simulate that. It'll pop up in the uh, global environment, three, two, one. There it is. And we can look at just the first 10 cats down in the console, three, two, one. There we go. Now these are kind of ugly because the decimal value is uh, very accurate. It actually goes out to um, quite a lot of decimals and um, the default display in R is uh, six, six decimals accuracy for, um, for numbers that are decimals. OK, now we could fix that, but I'm not going to bother to it for this one. Now, the traditional way to, to display or examine the distribution of um, continuous data is with a histogram. So here we've got our variable cats. It has our 1,000 values, and I've spruced up our um, histogram here with a with an actual um, title three two one, and there we go. An interesting thing is uh, just to demonstrate the the uh, function of set seed. If you look down here, and uh, I simulate this data again a couple of times one two three, you can see that the numbers are the same every time. And if I if I just remove from the selection, my set seed, and I uh, bring this up so we can see it a little bit, and I run that again a couple of times, one, two, three. We can see that they're different um, every time. So that's the function of the set seed. Now, um, is that all we're doing now? Do you go back to your slides now? Okay. You can talk about if you just do it for 100 cats. OK, if I just do it for 100 cats. So uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, introduce a couple of other concepts, sampling and vectors. It's always good in your spare time to come back and read about these. These are ones that have already used vector, but I have not used sample. Now, I wonder if, if Matt Butler is in the um, chat. I don't see him here, but at the end of the last um, meeting that we did, we talked about, um, Matt asked the question about his um, his experimental design with the blueberry plants all in a row, if you recall that. And um, he came to me just yesterday, and we used this sample to design his experiment to randomly allocate um, individuals to treatments. So this is one we use quite a lot. And I'm just going to go ahead and grab that code so that it's ready. I'll explain all of this when I grab the code. There we go. All right, so um, 
that what the sample vector does is uh, if you have some data, let's say we have a lot of a lot of data and we want to uh, to subsample it, or if we want to randomly shuffle all of the data, those are two things that the sample function does for us. That's the work that it does. The vector function um, simply creates a space uh, to to do some um, data storage. We've already used the vector function. So here what I'm doing is I'm going to make a variable called my means. Let's just make this slightly bigger. Um, we're going to use the vector function to create a, um, a vector that's of the mode numeric. So it's going to make something I can store numbers in there and it's going to make it of the length 100. So let's just run these and we'll also just look at what's in the my means vector when we make that a little. And this is called initializing a variable. Three, two, one, three, two, one. So I've made 100 um, spaces here. Now, by default, the vector um, function has filled our numeric vector with zeros. That's the default. Now, um, here what I'm doing is I'm saying, right, um, I'm introducing a new concept. This is the concept of the for loop. Don't worry about the for loop. We'll come back to it in the future. But in essence, if you want to do the same thing over and over, many times. In this case, we're going to do um, something 100 times from 1 to 100 times. If you're going to do some repetitive task some large number of times, the classic way to do it in, in computing is with a for loop. What we're doing is we're setting a, a variable i um, to the first number in our string, 1, and then we're going to increment it by one integer up to the maximum number of integers. So we don't have i at the moment in our workspace. Um, when we run this for loop, everything between these two curly braces is going to be done 100 times. What is happening here? Every time that the uh, integer is, is incremented, we're going to sample the um, the a cat's vector. Now the size of the vector that we're going to um, sample is uh, 30. So remember we've um, remember we've created that cat's vector with a thousand variables up above. So um, we're going to put the sample of 30 from our population of a thousand into my sample. What are we doing here? Well, we're we're simulating a case just like we might if we were um, working on some phenomenon as a scientist, where there's a relatively big population and it's it's inconvenient to sample every one of those thousand cats in our actual population. We're just actually going to, to ask, well, what happens if we can only sample 30 of them? Now with that my sample, we're going to uh, calculate the mean of it, and we're gonna put that in our vector, my means that we made. Remember, my means has 100 spaces in it. And every time this i increments, every time the for loop runs, we'll store the mean in that particular address. So the first time this runs with uh, i equals 1, if I just set i equal to 1, and I were to run this code, Then I were to um, ask, well, now what's in what's in all of my means? You see all zeros except for the first one, which now contains the mean of a sample of 30 cats from 1,000. The magic is that if we want to do it for all 100, we just have to hit go. 3, 2, 1, boom, 3, 2, 1, boom. So this simulates. Um, many experiments that you might do measuring the weight of cats or insert anything that you would measure in any experiment that you could do. This is a very powerful way of thinking about how the world works with respect to sampling. And then we really want to look at the results of our experiment here. So I'm using the histogram, going to Look at a histogram of my means, labeling it. And I also am going to draw a line at the grand mean, the mean of all means, 
which uh, which should be if we look up at our mean from our simulated population, it should be really close to four. So let's see what it looks like. Three, two, one. And it is pretty close to uh, to four. That's a really janky looking um, histogram. <clears throat> see if we can make it a little bit better. Not really, it looks a little bit better. An interesting thing about this before I hand it back to Megan is that we do still get some pretty extreme um, differences compared to where most of our samples are. And now these ones out here, um, I'll just plant this seed for the future that when we make the assumption that, uh, or, or when we do a statistical test and we make the assumption that our sampling is random in a population and we we set our p our alpha value that we compare our p value to to 0.05 we're making the bet that these weird values happen less than five percent of the time and okay. i think that's that's where you will come back <laughs> okay so if we're looking at the Gaussian distribution now, this is the one that probably most people will have seen um, when they've been sort of looking at histogram examples and things like that. And it's showing this sort of typical bell curve that you would see like the initial histogram we saw rather than the last histogram. Um, and this is basically used for continuous numerical variables um, and is generally associated like that. Most people will often refer to it as the normal distribution, mm. but Ed does not. And I will ask Ed to remind us why. Yeah, that's a good question. I like it when we're thinking and discussing these things. The, the reason I don't like to call it the normal distribution is because you now for, for continuous numeric variables, things like you know the height of people or the um, length of of thumbs in a population or you know the weight of cows all of those things are what we call continuous numeric variables and, and they tend to um, typically have that bell curve shape and, and one way of saying that in common English language is that it would be normal for them to have that bell curve shape but other things that we measure like the uh, the number of of species of plants in a hedgerow, that's a count. And uh, maybe it's the number of species of moths in a sample of hedgerow. Sometimes we'll find zero, sometimes we'll find one, sometimes we might find three or five. Those tend not to be bell curve shaped. They tend not to be Gaussian. So those, the, the typical um, distribution for, uh, for counts like that is one called Poisson, which we'll talk about next. The reason I don't like that word normal is in plain English, it implies that it's typical. So mm -hmm. that's why. Cool. Awesome. Um, and so moving on from that, Gaussian is the sort of distribution that's often used as part of important assumptions for statistical analyses, such as regression and ANOVA that we'll eventually get to in one of the later weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, this is where I think most people, if they were looking into the assumption of these statistical analyses, would probably come across the term that their data needs to be normally distributed. But I'm guessing that's where it's actually it needs to be more of a Gaussian assumption than normal. Yeah, a lot of people use that normally distributed. And I tend to say both when I'm talking to normal people. But uh, the there's a distinction to be made here. Uh, I put an emphasis on referring to the Gaussian for the raw measure and the assumption as, as we'll emphasize when we come to those future weeks for uh, these stats. It, it is that the, the error terms, the residuals are Gaussian or, or normally distributed, but the, I make a distinction between the residuals in a statistical model and that particular assumption and the uh, measures that are typically Gaussian. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that more in future weeks. Yeah. And then as Ed very nicely said earlier, um, you can generally describe the Gaussian distribution using the mean and the variance or the standard deviation. Um, 
so that's sort of the general overview of Gaussian assumption mm -hmm. and I can either hand over to Ed now to yeah. do some R. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh. Like one of the one of the ways you diagnose the distribution of your data is with graphs. And there are loads of different ways to diagnose them graphically. And one of the ways is if you were to draw a histogram of your data. And uh, let's say that let's say that let's focus on this tall blue curve here for a second. Let's say that your data, your sample that you measured had a mean of 10 and a standard deviation that's close to one. Um, what you could do is you could you could actually compare the the um, observed di distribution of your data in a sample with the theoretical Gaussian distribution that you would see. In a sample, we don't expect to uh, we make a distinction between the population you're sampling from and your sample itself, um, and so we don't expect to see exactly a Gaussian distribution for any sample from a from a a population that is in truth actually Gaussian, but it should be close. It should be recognizable. So sometimes we can just draw this theoretical curve of what we would expect to see were our data Gaussian. So I'll show you how to do that in R. <clears throat> These make really nice graphs um, to show other people too, but they're just used as um, diagnostic graphs. So if we um, if we look here, Looks like I have, um, I have, uh, let's see what we're, where we're going here. Where are the, uh, are, there we go, there are the graphs. Okay, so um, I'm just going to copy the a vector of means here, it looks like. Section is this 3.3. .3. I think this is just demonstrating means and standard deviations. So these represent the um, the descriptive characteristics of the of the plots we're we're going to draw curves for. So I've got one population at uh, mean of ten and a standard deviation of two one population at a mean of seven and a standard deviation of two and so forth. And then um, next we're gonna draw, this is kind of a fancy plot, but um, show it just in the in the case that you ever wanna make a, uh, a similar diagnostic plot for your own data. So um, the first thing we're gonna do is plot the, <clears throat> the um, a baseline plot. So I'm going to make the plot, look at it, and then we'll talk through what this function is doing. Oh, I've got to make my object X. Boom, boom. There we go. What I make, what I start off doing is make a sequence um, that will constitute the the x-axis. Let's just look at that sequence. It's a sequence of um, the numbers zero to twenty. And I'm incrementing it by 0.1 every time. So that's work that the uh, seek function does for us. It's just a way to make a sequence of data. Next, I'm going to make a, um, a uh, <clears throat> I'm going to use one of the norm family of functions. Before we used our norm, which is a random norm, but this time we're using D norm. The difference between D norm and R norm is that R norm creates the um, the the actual observed values simulated from a distribution that you define, and the the D norm um, does something fundamentally different. It it um, generates the the density is what the D stands for, which is which is the probability of a particular um, value occurring along those values of the x-axis. So if I um, just do this for the first um, value, so it's from our mean vec in position one, 
and the standard deviation that corresponds to it in our SD vec in position one. Boom. And let's look in the console, three, two, one. So these are all quite low numbers. These are scientific notation. If anybody hasn't encountered scientific notation, just yell and I'll explain it. But uh, in essence, um, these are all, all of these numbers are lower than, than one. And uh, they're in that standard scientific notation. If we have um, long decimal accuracy, the passive aggressive Butler will automatically revert to this. And you can alter this behavior if you want to, but it, it usually works for most people. So I'm going to make this plot, three, two, one. And I'm going to talk to you what this plot does. So I've, I've made that sequence of values for the X values. I've made that density set of values for the Y. I've um, set the limits of the Y axis, and I, I had to cheat a little bit. I would have set these limits by looking at all of the curves I wanted to make on this plot. Now I know that because I passed the uh, numbers that um, this curve, this is the theoretical density, a perfect Gaussian curve for a population that has exactly a mean of 10 and exactly a standard deviation of two, 10 and two. So um, <clears throat> now what I'm gonna do is draw in the other curves. And guess what? I'm gonna do a repetitive thing. This time I'm only gonna do it three times, but I wanna practice the for loop. This is a good way to uh, learn how to use these valuable tools. First, I'm gonna make a, a vector of different colors. So I'm gonna make one red, blue, and green, and so forth, three, two, one. And next, I'm going to um, create uh, some new Ys for the norm or um, the values one to three. But here I'm, I really, I've already done number one. So um, I, have, I have added one to my I variable within this. So this will actually, um, when I equals one, this will actually access the address one plus one, so two. In other words, this will go two to four. I just was thinking in my own code that I could have simplified this and uh, just cut to the chase. This is probably a better code, and this will work just as well. So uh, three, two, one, boom. And I've made um, new lines on there. For some reason now, I've only drawn um, two lines on there. In the interest of time, I'm not going to investigate why. Oh, I think I know why. <laughs> I think it's because um, I need to do that. So I'm going to do everything again. Boom, boom, boom. And then. What have I done? I minus one. There we go. The reason I had to change that was because I had made a vector of just three for my color, but then I had gone two to four, so I had to knock that off. Anyway, that's probably very confusing, so sorry about that, but play with it later. Do play with it later. Yes, and the colors are different because it's it's cycled through my new vector of colors. That's exactly right. Okay, and so now the last thing is that I'm going to add a legend. The way we can add a custom legend to graphs like this is with the legend function. I'm going to get a bit of title of mean um, parentheses SD, and the legend is just going to be the, the three different values of mean and SD. Notice how I've done um, 10 space and then in parentheses two here, and here I've done um, a space, two spaces, and a seven space, two. And I've just done this for aesthetic reasons, three, two, one, so that the one's digits um, line up. And I've specified those colors, and so now we have a interpretable, interpretable graph. Now with your own data, um, this is a way that I often use if I have um, a lot of data and it's important to, to uh, go through the, the distribution. I'm going to pass over to Megan, I think, just for a single slide before some more goes. I was just actually thinking that that sort of graph 
gives a good representation of why you should call it Gaussian and not normal. Yeah. Because they're all Gaussian distributions. Yeah. But none of them are looking the same as you might say something normal looks the same as a normal thing. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, there are a lot of intricacies in it, but yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to have to get your technical expertise to go back to PowerPoint. Oh, yes. I don't know how to do that. on your computer. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. <laughs> OK, so we also have this fun thing that's called a quartile quartile plot, commonly referred to as QQ plots. And this is something that you can use to look at your data and try and understand whether or not it's meeting um, the Gaussian distribution. And basically what it does is it sort of plots what you would expect the Gaussian dis distribution to look like. Um, if your data was Gaussian distributed. And then you can see your data sort of dotted around the line. And depending on how close your data is to that line will indicate how close your data is to a Gaussian distribution. Um, and again, as Gaussian data isn't always going to look the same, um, this can vary in terms of where the dots are around the lines and it doesn't necessarily always have to be perfect um, as there's very little data out there that I think is perfect um, but you can use these plots to help sort of identify some common problems that you might get with some of your data such as over dispersion or under dispersion um, and you can sort of see this with the sort of tails at the end of your QQ plot data lines. I don't think I worded that very well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm sure that's probably something to discuss a bit later. Yeah. Um, so there is a QQ plot example. I'll go through it as quickly as I can. I might just say a, a little thing before I show the example on on this. I think a comment I have about these QQ plots is one is that um they're they're one of the real common ways to do things. And the thing we're looking at here is uh, is this, this central line. And that central line represents, um, it represents the cumulative density function for a Gaussian sample based on the parameters of your actual dots of data. And uh, if you had a perfectly Gaussian sample, um, all of the, the dots would lie right along that, that line of density. And what, what that would mean is that if we look over at, at this line here, almost all the dots lie right on the line, right? It, it means that the proportion of the data we actually collected corresponding to, let's say, the values um, between negative one and zero they uh, we have exactly as much of that data in those those values as we would expect under a perfect Gaussian. These three different examples, one is um, a real small sample, and we can see that there is deviation of the um, the dots away from the line. They're not all exactly on the line, but none of them are systematically going off the line. And when we have small samples, we would tend to have errors like this. This large sample over here, um, it's uncanny how all of the dots are right on the line. I mean, I say it's uncanny, but um, as you'll see, we you know, sampled this intentionally to demonstrate this from a perfect Gaussian. And then something you're looking for um, here would be on this, on this sample, we have these, these dots that have um, veered off of the line by quite a lot. And I guess I should say that there's a confidence interval, these this lighter blue colored area on all of these graphs. And uh, we're we're if we have that confidence interval to guide the eye, we're looking for deviations away from that. And and they could be anywhere, but they tend to be at the edges, um, either at the top or the bottom. And if we have them at the top or the bottom, that means we either have too too many on that edge of the distribution or too little. And uh, that condition where we have too many or too little at the edges is, is called skew. 
So uh, for this one, it looks like we have um, too few at the top of the distribution. And it might be that the, the distribution for this one looks something like that, uh, where we, we don't have as many on this edge as we expect uh, were this to be perfectly Gaussian. Okay, so let's just go to R. We'll go to the web page. We'll look down at uh, this pot. I just want to see where we're at. Okay. So <clears throat> this is section 3.4. So um, there's a um, there's an influential book that this package goes with. It's an advanced stats textbook. Um, I think it's just called Classification and Regression, C A R CAR. Um, but it's got a lot of neat little tools in it. We're going to export one of the tools uh, in a second. And um, I think in the past we have gone through some chapters of CAR in past Herig meetings. Here, we're going to set up um, some graphs. Now, in those graphs you saw on the slide, there were three panels of graphs, one, two, and three. And um, to do that, to achieve that, um, that array of graphs, we're going to exploit this, uh, this code here. PAR is uh, there are a whole suite of what are called um, environment parameters. PAR stands, stands for parameters. We bring up the help menu for PAR, and we go down at, um, at a lot of the parameters. We can see that there are an awful lot of parameters that we can manipulate, but uh, we, almost, we almost never touch most of those parameters. But in this, in this case, we're going to set one of the parameters um, for the grid that lays out our, our, our graphs. Now, MF row defines a grid. The grid has two parameters, the number of rows and the number of columns. And we're just going to change that to two and two. The default is one and one. We just have, have the one graph. So we're just going to change this. We got to remember to change it back, so it always it always helps to. Um, what I always do is I just change it back with some code like that at the end of where I'm going. Um, we're going to again use set seed. We're going to uh, create a small sample with our norm. The sample size is going to be ten for our small sample, the mean of ten, and a standard deviation of two. And then we're going to make a QQ plot. Now, um, let's go ahead and make our data. Let's have a look at our data. So it's just some uh, boring regular data with lots of decimal accuracy. And um, then we're going to make our QQ plot. And there's our QQ plot. If I make it a little bit bigger, it'll look a little bit nicer. But that, that will just be the same one. Now, here we've got um, a few variables called out on the edge of the distribution across across our quantiles. And it's just highlighting us to ones that are really close to the edge. You know, they, you might be tempted to call these outliers, but calling something an outlier is, um, is uh, subjective. Yeah, but there are some objective ways to do it. And this is just one of the objective ways to do it. If it's important for you to, um, to um, <clears throat> objectively identify your outliers, you'll need to read a little bit more about that or we can talk about it in future ones. Now we're going to make a, a small, a large sample for a second graph. We're going to randomly sample a thousand from a population with 10 and 2. So the same exact population that we sampled up here, we're just sampling a lot more. So we're going to make our large sample, set our seed, boom, boom, and I'll make our large sample QQ plot. And that's exactly the one. And we still have a couple of suspicious characters at the ends there. And then finally, um, we're going to um, make a non-Gaussian sample. Now this one is um, 
<clears throat> I know this is a non-Gaussian sample. Th this is a powerful way of thinking about data and sampling is this way of thinking using simulation. So here I'm simulating a uniform distribution. Now, a uniform distribution would be like a fair six-sided dice, mm -hmm. uh, where if you did a, a dice 50 times, you should have roughly equal numbers of, um, of ones, twos, and so forth. So that would be a uniform distribution. So here, the parameters that define a uniform distribution would be uh, three, uh, well, a minimum value here we're using three and a maximum value here we're using 17. Why three and 17? Well, um, three and 17 capture a lot of the variation for the Gaussian population. So it covers the entire range. So it is somewhat comparable to the real data we have. You can just take my word for that or, or explore the data with the code yourself. Three, two, one, and then the QQ plot for that. And here, if I made a histogram of our uni in that little fourth space that we weren't using, it, there's a lot of error in a uniform distribution with, with that many different possible values. Um, but, but our expectation is that we have um, um, the number of values that is um, 50 divided by the number of integers we're spanning here observations. So uh, again, the um, if we were to increase this quite a lot, uh, it comes close to uh, what we expect. Mm -hmm. So if I just go back to the previous graph, um, that just demonstrates how you use this. It's very easy to use and uh, check this, and you'd usually use it on your um, your raw data if you were wanting to investigate whether or not it was Gaussian. Mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed to say it. I only just realized that it, that was our uni, uni not run in. Ah. I've been misreading that for a very long time. It's, it's okay. <laughs> now, now you know, that's the beauty of the R users group. Yes. Okay. So now we're going to sort of explore some Poisson distributions, which always for some reason reminds me of fish. Mm. <laughs> you speak a little French? Yeah. Makes sense. So this is basically the sort of data that is generally Poisson distributed is often count data, such as the count of fish that you catch during a fishing trip. Um, and often this data is in integer format. And so Whilst you could, in theory, catch half a fish, if a shark decided to have a snack or something, chances are, when you're looking with Poisson distribution and count data, that you're going to have integers rather than decimal places um, in your data. And because you're looking at count data, you can often end up with a lot of zeros, which can cause your Poisson data to be very skewed towards the right um, and often when you look at this in a histogram form, you might have a super tall bar at your zero end of the scale in comparison to the rest of your data. Um, and in terms of how a Poisson distribution is described, in comparison to Gaussian, which had your mean and your standard deviation, here we instead have lambda, which is sort of describing that instead. And I believe Lambda generally is sort of the peak of your distribution, looking at the mean or the average number of occurrences or counts mm -hmm. that you get within your time frame that you've recorded your counting mm. in. Yes. <laughs> Question is, can you, I like your example of catching fish. It fits this perfectly. Yes. Can you catch negative fish when you go out? No. No, it's another characteristic of the Poisson yeah. distribution. Yeah, <laughs> because you can't really count nothing if it's not there, and if it's not there, you get zero. That's right. So, yeah. Cool. I think there is some more code for this. Yes. If you wanted to yes. play with that real quick. The Poisson distribution happens to be my favorite distribution. Um, it, was, uh, it was described mathematically by uh, a gentleman named Monsieur Poisson. He humbly named it after himself, like a lot of things in statistics. Uh, he actually uh, is an interesting story about the, have you heard the 
the actual example that Monsieur Poisson used to define the Poisson distribution. Mm -hmm. Allow me to tell you, it's one of my favorite stories in all of statistics that um, Poisson uh, was interested in um, in war statistics, and he uh, had a data set from the Prussian army, which was the count of soldiers who were killed in a particular year by being kicked by a horse. Now, the Prussian army was famous for their cavalry. So some years there were zero, some years there were one, some years there were two, uh, and that was the original data set used to demonstrate the um, the Poisson distribution. Okay, let's go to the web page. Let's see now the Poisson. So uh, we have another random variable here. There we go. Okay, so um, the the function that will simulate Poisson is is the POIS Poisson. Um, family functions. We have the density and some other ones uh, that you can explore later, but by far the ones we use most often for these are the R and the D versions of them. Now, what is this? Um, as Megan said, the um, lambda is the parameter rather than mean and standard deviation, which each could assume any value for the, for the Gaussian. For Poisson, it's a characteristic of the distribution that um, the mean and standard deviation are equal, and they're both described by the lambda parameter, but it, it stands for the mean and the, the standard deviation. Um, here, we're going to simulate 20 values with a mean of four. We should expect um, some, some zeros and maybe some values up to eight. Let's just see what we get, three, two, one. There we go. So we don't even get any zeros and we don't get any higher than seven. OK, for this, if we if we were to simulate more. Now we have uh, we have some eights and zeros scattered in there and I don't see any nines, but if we did indeed quite a lot. Now we have a nine, now we have a 10, but again, it's on oh, no, 13. We're still adhering, though, to the uh, principle that we can't um, go below zero. So these are the characteristics just illustrated through a little simulation of the Poisson distribution. All right, talking about a little formalities there, and we're going to just um, graph Poisson. The so set seed here, where I'm going to get 30 values of lambda equals three, three, two, one, and make a histogram of it. Now look at that. I didn't um, reset my my graph, so I'm just going to reset that. Go back and remake that graph. There we go. So uh, this is typical of a Poisson distribution. We don't have any zeros in this, and so we're we're kind of truncated um, here at one. Typically, if you were going to graph a Poisson distribution, um, you you might take the extra step of making sure that the range of the x-axis did include zero, just to visually include that part that's fair game for the distribution. If we were to increase this just a little bit, uh, almost anything is going to have one. Now, as Megan said, the the highest point will tend to be around the mean, but because of this skew, it's usually not exactly in the highest point. It's usually skewed a little bit, usually towards the right. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, the example I've made up here with simulated data is the number of um, triplets in, in some U's. Okay, so this implies that of out of uh, 100, use, you know, one sample might be, um, might have eight use with triplets, but the commonest number would be, um, you know, th around three use with tripl triplets for this particular population. Okay. Now, again, we can make the density plots for them. 
So we're going to um, set up some different lambdas. There's a property that I haven't mentioned of the Poisson distribution yet that um, this is one that's exploited a lot by ecologists and, and also some agriculture biologists, but, um, but I really see a lot of ecologists, especially entomologists, exploiting this one, is that as um, count data increases by its as a function of its mean, um, the distribution tends to assume the Gaussian, similar to Gaussian. And the reason for that is that um, the mean and the standard deviation drifts towards the right, coming away from that zero that truncates the distribution on one side. So as the mean migrates to the right, um, it does assume a, a bell-shaped distribution. See how close we can get to that with this example. I see a lot of um, entomologists and other interesting people that count things uh, do that because then it allows them to ignore the fact it's a Poisson distribution and they can just use regular Gaussian statistics and it's mostly okay. Okay, so we're going to make a baseline plot. We're going to make our sequence of 0 to 15 by 1, 3, 2, 1. Let's look at that. It's a boring sequence. We're going to use our um, density um, for our Poisson for the um, lambda equal to 1, 3, 2, 1. It's our y1. Whoops. Didn't make our lambda yet. There we go. There we go. Now let's make our first plot. 3, 2, 1. So we can see with a lambda of one, we've got this extreme skew, you know, to the uh, to the right. The skew's going on, and there are zero values for most of those. And just like before, we're going to make some new colors. I'm going to leave my four code, and you can play with this later to um, reassure yourself of how it works. Three, two, one, and you can kind of see how as lambda changes from one to three to five that it's almost like an emergent Gaussian coming out. The entomologists are happy. Okay, and then our legend. Okay. All right. Cool. Then the last distribution we're gonna talk about today is the binomial distribution. So this is generally where there's only sort of two outcomes. Um, common sort of examples of this is if you were to flip a coin, you can only really get heads or tails. Um, or if you're answering a yes or no question, um, or if you're asking if something is red or it isn't red, it might you would get true for it being red and false if it was any other colour. Um, and so this is generally sort of counting successes um, in, with independent events that you're sampling. Um, and I believe the data coding can be quite variable, um, but you can either have it's sort of with dummy variables as zero and one for one for success, zero for not successful. Um, but then there is also the option to have it as the sort of number of successes out of the total. But I don't know if that's quite what we're covering. It also could be other things, though, too. If, if let's say that there are species in a hybrid zone, you could have one species or the other, A and B, Tom and Fred. You could have, uh, if it's two competitors um, in a sports event, it, it could be which one comes in first. Mm -hmm. So the coding can be quite variable. And one of my favorite ones on this, uh, I mean, this is a very important distribution. We're joking a little bit, but this is the minimum that I think people should be very comfortable thinking about at the graduate level, uh, is when you have a case where you have a lot of, let's say a lot of your data is a single value, and then you have counts of something other than that. Megan explained this with some count data, you have inflated zeros. Now there are ways that are very complicated and rife with assumptions to model that, but uh, an easy way to model that is a binary way. If you have a lot of zeros, you could have a lot of zeros and then some ones, a few twos, a few threes and so on, or you could just have zero and other than zero. It's a very powerful way about thinking about your own data. Cool. Um, and I'm handing over to you again. Oh, right. yeah. Okay. Um, right. to do some more 
coding. That's all right. Also, I just did one in slide. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. OK, so I think this is the last coding session. Binomial distribution. Typically, when we if I just exploit these doodles, one of the things that we want to do with binomial, we, we're not going to do it on this way, but I just want to say this thing before we go on, is that uh, if you have a, a zero and a one across some value of X, this could be anything. This could be the amount of um, a certain treatment and a dose or could be amount of a certain amount of food additive or a certain amount of a trace chemical. One of the things that we might want to do is um, come up with a probability of uh, of assuming a value of one or or zero as a function of this this x variable. <laughs> but we're just going to um, look at um, something else. Now, one of my past research projects was uh, looking at survivorship in dormice. Um, and one of the ways we did it was uh, now survivorship itself could be zeros and ones. But one of the ways that we measured survivorship was um, we went to places where there were dormouse um, nest boxes. This is part of the National Dormouse Monitoring Project. And we just uh, looked for whether or not there were dormice present in a particular box. So that's what this aims to do. Let's see here, this is 5.2. Okay. Let me just pull this out here a little bit. So what this is doing is uh, making the um, binomial, a random binomial number here, um, we're doing 50 observations. Each observation is just um, one observation. And the probability of, um, of success uh, or presence in this case is 0.3. Okay, so set seed, boop, boop. So we should have about one third of our vector here be, um, be ones. So this is the population I've done. Now, one way to um, to show this data is a mosaic plot. This is not a common plot type no. for for ecologists, but in other fields, it's very common. And for the binomial distribution, um, it is the the appropriate plot type. So what this does is we're going to make a table of our occurrence data three, two, one, and um, we. We have, you know, we're we're meant to. We drew this from a population with one third successes. But we have a bit of a, you know, skew here in our sampling, our sampling error. What we're doing here with the mosaic plot is we are. Um, let me just change the color of this because it'll just bother me. There we go. <clears throat> we're um, making a special kind of plot that uh, has one one area for each of the uh, possible values, and we're um, creating the a width of those variables by the amount of observations we have for each value, and we can specify the color three, two, one. There's not much difference here in this particular um, plot. I haven't bothered to label the axes, but if I labeled the column and um, row names in this table, if I took the time to do that, that would be reflected on my mosaic plot. This is a powerful kind of plot. I keep trying to recommend it to people that have this kind of data. Um, but yeah, it takes a little getting used to. For another example, we're just going to look at uh, flipping a coin. So maybe um, 20 people um, do an experiment where they flip a coin 10 times and we record the number of uh, values that they get. So um, here, this is again random binomial. We're doing 20 experiments. Each experiment has 10 observations, and it's a fair coin for the probability of heads. Um, all of these binomial ones generalize to having ones and zeros uh, at some level. So here we go, three, two, one. And we've printed it out. And uh, remember, this is the um, the number of heads 
that we get. So it looks like we range from two up to eight. OK, so it is seems pretty balanced. And um, then we're just going to make a new mosaic plot. Now brace yourself on this one. It, it will look a little a little weird, but we'll talk through it. There we go. Now what we what we expect is um, we've done a relatively small number of experiments. We we should expect the widest um, column to be the five, but we don't get that. Um, we get some bigger ones over here. But remember sampling error. So what we could do is we could run this ex this sampling exercise a few times, keep our eye on the five um, column. Three, two, one, boom, boom, boom. It's kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. The way to adjust in your mind what you expect to see here is what if we did like a large number of experiments? Three, two, one, three, two, one. And all of a sudden it starts to look exactly like what we expect. The largest number of experiments has um, has exactly five and it lessens the number of times where we get six or four less still for seven and three and so forth out to where um, 10 and, and zero are very rare. Now, that's kind of a blast about, is, are there any more slides? Um, it's just one, but. Okay, go for it. Kind of a... Yeah, go for it. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> cool. So the last sort of bit to talk about today is sort of, the practice of diagnosing the distribution that your data might have um, and how you might go about that regularly. So we've looked at three different kinds of distributions today and how that's associated with different data types. And so when you have designed your experiment and you've collected your data, hopefully you'll have a rough idea of whether your data is continuous data, whether it's a discrete count variable, or if it's sort of binomial. Um, and from that, you could, in theory, then consider what you would think your distribution would be based on that. So with count data, you would be expecting Poisson distribution, continuous data, Gaussian distribution, and so on. Um, and then what you can do from there is you can graph your data, much like we've shown today, using histograms and QQ plots and have a look at whether it appears to be meeting those sort of expectations of those different distributions. Um, and again, with the key key plots, you can sort of see how it meets the standard Gaussian distribution expectation and whether there's any sort of variation or deviation from that and where that deviation might be. Um, and yeah, then you can sort of use that distribution in your statistical analyses um, to make sure that you get the most accurate model. And I'm sure Ed probably has some really insightful things to add. The only thing I'll add to that is that the thing that most people are concerned about usually is whether or not your assumption of um, Gaussian residuals is correct. That's, you know, 90% of people only know about that and they only care about that. And this is just a series of, of uh, ways that you can inspect your own data. But uh, in, I think starting from the next talk, there are some formal statistical tests. We haven't actually done any statistical tests yet, but there are some formal statistical tests that you can do. But it's important to make a distinction between your raw data uh, and the uh, the uh, distribution it may assume based on what you expect based on the data type versus that assumption of Gaussian. But we will learn some some uh, statistical tests for diagnosing the distribution. Is that all we have? Yes. Sir. I see we're we're a little over time, so sorry about that. And some people have uh, have gone. It's my fault because I told all those stories about Monsieur mm -hmm. Poisson and so forth. So uh, thanks for coming. And if there aren't any burning questions, we'll uh, see you next week. See everybody later.
I'm going to end the video here. Thanks for Megan, did a great job.